So welcome to our practical application of optical mixing and creating mud in our yarns. I'm so glad you are here and joining us. This is the second part of a two-part series this month on this subject. Part one is available to patrons of the community and I hope you will consider joining at patreon.com slash wool and spinning to check it out. The second part of our discussion this month is my practical application of the theory, those little samples that tell us so much about our spinning, and the community samples that they provided to deepen and expand this discussion. I'm excited to share with you what they put together. Like last month, everything is linked below and it is invaluable. Thank you to each and every one of you for sharing your work and for the journey. All right. Let's do this. I just need to cover a wee bit of housekeeping before we move along. To be able to see all of the posts that are available to you each month, please have a look at the Ketchup and Pickles housekeeping post for February of 2023 that will be released around the middle of the month. It is linked down below. It will, be, it will have all of the links that you need to navigate the things that you wish to engage in. Links to the indices for all of the vlogs and the PDFs, previous episodes of Wool and Spinning Radio, and the Wool Circle are also linked in there for you. So please have a look down below and I hope to see you over in the community soon. So earlier this month we explored what optical mixing is, questioned some previous wisdom about the conversations around optical mixing in our spinning, and we began exploring how we create mud in our yarns accidentally or intentionally. This is something every spinner has done in their spinning career and I remember when it happened to me the first time. I asked my mom what had happened and her response was classic. The entire color wheel is in there. Of course that would happen. I was sort of dumbfounded and was like, really? She looked at me and said, oh yeah. That was my first real life introduction to how color affects our creative lives. I did eventually knit up that yarn and in the end it was actually really pretty, um, but it was, you know, it was quite grayed out and it was dull. Lesson learned. So for my sample this month, I took a lovely braid of Sweet George Yarns fiber from my stash. I pulled all the colors apart and carded them together uh, and carded together the blue and the yellow to see if I could create green. In there was some of the purple because in places there was dye on the staple at each end that was varied. We've discussed this in the past, but that's part of spinning. That dye on each end of the staple slipping past each other is what sometimes creates some of the mud that we talked about earlier this month. I lightly layered the fibers onto the cards and did two passes between the cards before clamping the card to my table and pulling the fibers off in a roving style preparation, which is similar to a mini bat off of the drum carter. I spun and plied it. So let's see what the community did with this experimentation. It was super interesting. Remember from part one uh, that each remember from part one that each month I will be putting out a call to the community for their interpretations on color. This month I reached out on the Slack channel and asked for the following. For February, it'll be about optical mixing. Again, just very small samples, less than five grams. Enough to get an idea of what things look like. The assignment is very general. Show us optical mixing, try to create a new color by employing optical mixing, and then secondly, try to create mud intentionally. It's actually harder than you think. 
I'll have more, but start there. And I'm only thinking for like two or three samples each time. I love that you guys went above and beyond and please continue to do that. Just know that I'm also happy with two or three samples for each who want to participate, but can't take on anymore. Let's keep the barrier to entry really low. <laughs> I can't wait to share with you what they put together. It's incredible. So let's first start with the experiments on optical mixing. And then after we explore my samples for creating mud, we'll explore theirs just to keep things organized and logical. Kicking us off, Florence shares her experience to create experiments to create orange. So Florence says something unexpected happened here. Theoretically, I did my standard five grams with one gram 20% change with each sample. Now, I don't believe that I have made a mistake, but two of the samples are visually identical. Unfortunately, I don't have any more of this fiber here with me, but I'm going to repeat those percentages with fiber that I do have to see what happens. Something really different happens around yellow. So I will see, so I will be interested to see if my conclusion is a mistake. The first photo, so this photo is without the repeat. So this photo is without the extra skein. This next one is from Ruth. Ruth shared her experiments in order to create optical mixing. I focused on the process or the quote effort needed in order to create optical mixing. I used hand cards, but would a drum card, but what would a drum carder do? What would combing do? What would a blending board do? And what would Eve do? <laughs> I am the one who needs to look at instructions and then pick up my tools to see if I understand. Often there is an aha moment in the in that first round or a rabbit trail. In this case, it was a rabbit trail. I picked up two relatively equal portions of each color and I loaded them on the carter. And from the first swipe, I was curious how long it would take me to get to an even blend. Thus, the pictures and the focus. There is so much to explore about blending colors of dyed wool, and I am sure I will get many of them in this year of color. While I also want to explore dyeing yarn and fabric, I really like the liveliness of a color blended with others. They feel more personal. I totally agree, Ruth. So by that, I mean you might recognize some of the little dots of color that just refused to blend while you handle the resulting yarn or fabric. You see the color play change slightly as you progress through a larger project. Now on to mud. Thank you so much, Ruth, for your sharings and for your thoughts and your insights. I think you're absolutely correct. This is from Malin. She shares her findings from her first two experiments. I chose to blend blue and red to hopefully get purple. I made a total of 9.5 gram samples ranging from 8.8 parts red to 8.8 parts blue. To make the yarn appear as blended as possible, I spun very thin singles on my spindle and I chain plied to preserve the color order. I then knitted a tiny swatch to see if there was any differences between the yarn samples and a knitted sample. All in all, I am quite happy with the end result. Two things that I found particularly interesting were one, seeing how very small proportions of the second color, say one, one one part blue to eight parts red or one part red to eight parts blue made a much more interesting color than the quote pure colors as mentioned in a recent interview on the wool circle and two although the middle colors are perceived as neither red nor blue they do not really look like classical purple either and is quite dark generally the blended colors appear darker than the pure colors Malin went on to do more, some more swatching, which is also very cool. So let me share that with you now. So she says, while well, swatching for the first challenge for this month, I played a little with the yarns I made for the previous challenge and made a tiny entrelac swatch. It was the first time I had tried entrelac, so the swatch is definitely not perfect, but I am super happy with it anyways. In particular, I like how it makes it possible to compare both the blends of each color, red, green, and blue, and the blends with the same added color, gray, black, and white. I realize it is too late for the first challenge, but I just wanted to share my new favorite swatch. Who says it's never too late? It's so much fun. So much fun to see what everybody's doing. Thank you, Malin. And last but certainly not least, Amanda shares her experiments. I decided to explore the effect of the mixing green from blues to yellows that buy it and how they biased differently. My starting palette was a warm and cool variant of each. This means that for each hue, one biased towards green and the other biased away from green. 
Each sample I made in this batch consisted of one gram of blue and one gram of yellow. I blended the fiber thoroughly on hand carters and then I put the fiber on my blending board to diz off as roving. Sample number one, the green biased blue and the green biased yellow resulted in a prismatic green. Sample number two, which was a violet biased blue and an orange biased yellow, ended up resulting in a muted green. Actually, I would call this a chromatic gray. I really love that particular one. Sample number three was a green biased blue with an orange biased yellow, and that resulted in a muted green. Note that it was is nowhere near as muted as the version above with both primaries biasing away from green. Sample number four was a violet biased blue and a green biased yellow and it resulted in a muted green. Once again it is muted uh, with prismatic but now but nowhere near as much as the version with both primaries biasing away from green. Here they are as a set together with prismatic green on the left and chromatic gray on the right. That photo already cycled through on the slideshow here. It's coming in just a moment. I thought that maybe the tinting strength of the cool yellow might have played a part in how I was interpreting the results. So I repeated the same blends, but with three to one yellow to blue rather than one to one. On the left of the image are the green one to one samples and on the right of the image are the yellow green three to one samples. And you can see that the two middling muted colors are being affected differently but that they are clearly yellow green now. I also feel vindicated in calling the most muted green a chromatic gray, as when I added more yellow to the blend, it looks like a toned yellow rather than a green, yellow green like the others. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I will actually put up just the photo of those greens so that you guys can see what those look like because they were pretty cool when you actually see them next to each other. So those are the two sets of greens in the end that she made. It's very cool. Thank you, Amanda. Now on to making and creating mud. This was so much fun. I want to say it was even more fun than the optical mixing, but that's really not fair. So one of the first things that I noticed with everyone's samples was the overwhelming beauty of the samples. They were just stunning. As I have previously mentioned, I think the reason people are tripped up with these yarns when in large skeins, freshly spun, is the misalignment between expectations and outcomes. If one is expecting a beautiful skein of yarn from a gorgeous hand-painted braid and the colors are combined while spinning, especially if there is dye on each end of the staple that are across, that are, um, across one another on the color wheel, or even multiple colors on each staple, the resulting skein will be muted and dull. Sometimes we need to look more closely at how much space between each color is allotted. Katrina has actually talked about that on previous episodes of Woolen Spinning Radio when her and I talked about braiding color studies like over the years. More space will equal less color blending between colors. Obviously, there will be some optical mixing, some areas where the fibers slide next to each other as you transition to the next color. But that's what creates those lovely color transitions in our finished fabrics. One of the only ways to keep the colors as clean as possible when spinning those really beautiful hand-painted braids is by chain plying or leaving the singles as singles. For my sample, I combined all of the colors that were present in the Sweet Georgia braid so that, that I had in my stash to spin. I shared with you the optically mixed sample already, and here is the gray muted sample. Next to the braid, you can see how truly dulled this became. It really registers as sort of a gray brown now. And while there is some beautiful purple underlying the color of the skein, I would be pretty disappointed with this if I had spun the braid thinking that it would remain brilliant and vivid. 
Of course, we are putting all of this under a microscope and I can see how truly beautiful this little guy is. But if it wasn't what you'd expected and you'd spent close to $330 Canadian on the fiber in the first place, you might be pretty bummed. The next two samples I made were possible because my fiber that I'd ordered uh, finally showed up. <laughs> it is Coriadale, it's dyed in the primary colors. I've been slowly spinning through it and making my own carded color wheel, which I'll hopefully have done and be able to share with you next month. But from there, I knew I could blend everything else. So I made these on my hand cards and I decided to do two blends so that we could see what happens. One is blended only once, while the other is blended many times. Using the three primaries in equal parts, this gives us an opportunity to see what happens when we blend and change the preparation. As expected, the, blending the blended skein has very tiny, almost invisible dots of color and appears duller. In contrast, the sample that was not blended, but instead just dizzed off, I called this sample once blended, just to keep them straight. Um, it has larger dots of color and it remains brighter. If this wasn't what you were planning on either sample though, you can understand why this would be so disappointing as a finished product. Because the samples from the community were so amazing uh, with this experimentation, I thought I would share those with you now. So this first one is actually from Malin. I love this so much. So for my final post of today, this is from Malin. Here are my attempts at making mud. I definitely agree that this was hard. My initial idea was that mixing complementary colors would make mud, and hence, in all of my samples, I mixed exactly two dyed colors that seemed to be close to complementary. However, I still don't really know how to find out which blue-green that is exactly complementary to the orange that I had. Many of the blends I made seem to have a small tint no matter what the ratios I blended. And also, even when the colors I blended seem to be quite close to complementary, there was a very fine balance in not making the blend lean against one of the original two colors. Close up, several of the yarns also have a tweed-like effect, which I think made the mud a bit prettier. I love that. So one of the things that I think um, is sometimes missed when we're making mud is that if you use complementary colors to blend and to make our mud, which I think is a great place to start, um, my inclination was to do the same, mostly because I would only have to blend two um, fibers together rather than three, so red, yellow, and blue, or magenta, cyan, and yellow if you're using the CYM color wheel. Uh, if we're going to blend those three together to make sort of that brownie gray dull red and we have to be aware of which yellow we're choosing and which blue we're choosing and which red we're choosing because it's going to lean one way or the other uh, depending on the, the dyes that were used. However, if we're using complementary colors, we're taking an orange that theoretically is equal parts yellow and red and then we're taking one entire part blue to make that complement, right? So now you've got one part blue, a quarter part red, and a quarter part yellow. So you've still got the primary colors just in a slightly different ratio. So it's a great place to start, but just know that if we're blending complements for those who are newer to this and are sort of trying to understand, um, you've still got all the primary colors. So if you blend the secondaries, if you blend the tertiaries, you're still dealing with the primaries. So one of the things that I found really helpful in my exploration was actually just sticking with those three primaries and starting to think about and to play with the ratios of each of the primaries. So do I want one, one part blue to a quarter red and a quarter yellow to make the whole, to make 100%? Uh, do I want a third of each? Do I want you know a quarter blue, a quarter yellow, and half 
red, and so on. So that's another way to think about it for those who are maybe struggling with some of the numbers and some of the math. But these samples are amazing. So thank you, Malin, for your, for your work. This next one is making mud from Florence and her spun samples to try to attain mud. A little update first off the mud. Usually I have a real desire to clarify that my yarn and fiber is not as bright as the phone camera is reading, but this time it is actually quite close to reality. The superwash merino died to saturation, I think, and this is red and blue and yellow in equal quantities. Visually, it is absolutely brown, except for the tiny spots of color that are naps in the fiber. She definitely made a gorgeous brown. It is really, really lovely. And you can also see her three little skeins at the one end of just her primaries, which is actually a great way to be able to see how the colors changed. So wonderful. Thank you, Florence. This one is from Ruth and she shares her muddy experiments as follows. What color is your mud? When mud was requested, I thought about the times when people posted they had mixed opposite colors to get a grayish or neutral tone. So that was going to be my approach. I started by mixing red and green. I wasn't as satisfied as I thought it would be. So I added orange, then purple to the original blue, green, uh, red, green mix, hoping to bring a more dirt like tone to the final product. Again, not completely satisfied satisfied so I went for blue along with the orange and the purple that gave a really deep brownish tint my last step was to add some gray to it to lighten it up and see if I preferred that the results can be read from left to right on the image that has plied yarn I am actually quite pleased with all of the brown tones produced but I am not sure any of them are quite mud quote unquote it's harder than you think they're also fantastic. I love your samples, Ruth. They were absolutely beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And finally, last but certainly not least, Amanda shares her experiments with us. I had two little play sessions for mixing mud. The first was based on complementary colors. It was pure eyeballing it and intuition. The second was based on using my co-primary palette. From set one, here's my mud based on adding red and green together. The fiber uh, sample cards showed the colors in the blend. The yarn on the left is the blend I made and the yarn on the right is a tint. So. Um, these these photos are going to cycle through, but you'll you'll see them in a moment. Also from set one, here is my bud based on adding red, violet, and yellow together. These are them here. Again, the sample card shows uh, sample sample cards show the colors in the blend. The yarn on the left is the blend I made, and the yarn on the right is a tint. This ended up being a straight one to one blend. For set two, I started with my co-primary palette and the samples I had made. The most muted green variant is a chromatic gray. We talked about that already. And so I created it and a muted orange. I then blended those together. Ultimately, this is equal parts of four of a six color of the six colors of the co-primary palette and it produced a really nice warm mud. I suspect that this is partly because although there is uh, more yellow represented in the mix. Yellow has the lowest tinting strength. Beautiful. Continuing on from there, really muddy mud would have all the colors, so I added the remaining two colors to make an equal blend of all six fibers in my co-primary palette. Picture here, my mud is sitting on top of my prismatic color wheel samples with the original mud to the bottom and a tint to the top. That's this here. Isn't that incredible? Just the photo alone is beautiful. Really fun to see. Thank you so much, Amanda, for all of your sampling as well. You guys have been just doing an incredible thing, a, 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 an incredible amount of work. An alternative way of thinking about this particular mud is as a blend of the secondary triad. I've included a picture of my mud on top of the prismatic secondary triad and in the other picture it is on top of the most muted version of the secondary triad. Both would result in the same mud. That's actually a really good visual, Amanda, so thank you so much for throwing that in at the end of your post. I really appreciated that and it was good even for me to see it. 
Thank you again to everyone who participated. We are richer for your contributions. Next month, we will be starting our exploration of color contrasts in our spinning. This is getting into the weeds of color and builds on our introduction, looking at hue, value, and saturation. I can't wait to begin applying these principles to our repertoire of knowledge, and I'm excited to see how the community applies the principles in their samples. It's going to be really interesting. At the same time, Rebecca has been exploring color wheels on the wool circle and will be moving into hand blending, further building on this content and going even deeper. It's all very exciting. See you next month. As always, share your findings with us either here on the Slack channel under hashtag general or in the Ravelry group. Be sure to share your projects, your spins, your makes, your reflections using hashtag wool and spinning so that others can see your stuff as well. And don't hesitate to tag me and Rebecca so that we can see because sometimes we do miss it. Until next time, happy spinning, happy experimenting, and happy playing with color. Bye everyone.